message today um, is called Drop Everything. Um, we are in the series called Drop In. And uh, if you've seen the pictures that Annie's been, uh, been posting on Facebook and Instagram and whatnot, I love the way she's just changing the colour of, of the door for every single message. Um, li- little things which I just think are really, really lovely. Um, something really simple we can do is just post those uh, pictures on your Facebook page or Instagram or whatever social media you have and get the message out, okay? Really, really. It helps because the, the message gets out, yeah? Um, the day after tomorrow um, is a, is a, a movie um, that came out uh, probably, probably about 15 years ago now. Um, and, it, and it talks about a sudden freeze that hits the world and a, a, a new ice age. And, um, and basically, the, the concept is that, that people are just there in their, their, their normal life and then all of a sudden this, this frost just, just hits and everybody is stranded or, or, or they, they freeze to death. But um, it, it's classic, you know, these disaster movies, they want to destroy New York or, or uh, San Francisco generally. Um, and New York is destroyed in the process of this, this film. There was a, a great cheer when I went to see it at the cinema because there's this one scene at the end where it says that Mexico opened its borders and, uh, and all the Americans were like running across the river and, and all the Mexicans just went, yay, because they, they, they thought that was really funny. Um, but, but the truth is, so many people had, having to survive, they just had to drop everything and just, and just flee for their lives. Um, refugees, you know, in war-torn places, they just, they just pick up what they can. They, they, they drop their lives and they just flee. Uh, and there are refugee camps all over the world where, where people are living in that way right now. They're in a transition phase. Some of those are going to be transition phases that last pretty much a lifetime for some of them. Um, but they drop everything to survive. I was trying to remember a moment in my own life where I had to drop everything. Um, and it's usually I drop everything because I'm trying to carry everything. That's, that, that's the, the one thought that came to mind. Um, I only ever want to do one trip from the car to the house or upstairs. I only want to do it one trip, so I try to take everything and end up dropping everything. A moment where I've had to drop everything and, and react um, was um, when Sophie was born. Uh, we were just, you know, we were waiting. It was that time. And then all of a sudden, Annie just says, I think it's happening. And boom, we had to drop everything and, and react, get her to the hospital. We still had time to watch Man City versus uh, West Ham, I think it was. Um, they had, they had a, a, a TV in the... In, in, in the, the, the waiting room, whatever. And so we were there waiting and it just happened to be on. So um, I was like, can you change it to Liverpool? No, okay, no, no problem. That was pretty much the only time that I've, I thought about having to drop everything and react. The other two girls, they were, were planned C-section. So, um, you know, it was like we already knew. We, we had all, we'd, we'd picked the date, basically. Um, it's usually an emergency, for good or for bad, that someone will have to drop everything and react. When someone says, drop everything and just just react, yeah? The phrase, drop everything, means to stop whatever you're doing and focus on something else, usually life-threatening or life-affecting. If someone says, drop everything and and respond, the the refugees, they drop everything and they just have to to pick up what they can and then they go, yeah? Probably because their safety is in question. If there's if there's a fire, whenever you go to a big meeting, they'll say, right, we're not expecting a fire. Well, that's good. That's good, they're not expecting a fire. So if the alarm goes, then drop everything and, 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 and head for the exits. Drop everything. In the, the film The Shawshank Redemption, there is a, a fellow named Tommy Williams. Who's seen The Shawshank Redemption? Amazing film. Um, and there's this, there's this young uh, convict. Um, he, he's, he's welcomed into the prison and... And, and the, the narrator says, oh, and we love this guy immediately. We, all his stories, we loved him immediately. And he's telling this story and he says, so I'm backing out the door, right? And I got the TV like this. It was a big old thing. I couldn't see anything. Suddenly I hear this voice that says, police, kid, hands in the air. You know, I was standing there holding onto that TV. So finally the voice says, did you hear what I said, boy? And I said, yes, sir, I sure did. But if I drop this thing, you got me on destruction of property too. 
<laughs> Drop everything. You know, sometimes it's a bit more difficult. Um, romantic comedies, they usually have the trope where uh, at the end, the, the, the male character will suddenly realise what a buffoon he's been, what an idiot he's been, why, why it is that he can overcome whatever it is that he needs to overcome in order to be with the girl, and then he drops everything and chases after, usually at the airport or, or some big family gathering, some public assembly where he has to declare publicly his, his love, Ross and Rachel, at the airport several times. They drop everything for that great big purpose of love. They drop everything for love. The love, just say, no, I'm going to drop everything. I'm just going to go. And they, they put their life in peril in order to get there, to, to be able to declare, I love you. The Bible has many drop everything moments. The Bible has, has many, many. I was thinking about it, and, and, and as I was preparing this, I just, uh, one after, the after, after another, after another, after another, just came to my mind, came to my heart. Wow, God, God you, you really have a lot of drop everything moments. So I'm going to go through some of the drop everything moments just so that you are clear that God is a God of drop everything moments. Yeah? Abraham, Genesis 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. And I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. That's why we bless Israel, because if you bless Israel, you will be blessed, and if you curse Israel, you will be cursed. So I don't want to be cursed, so I'm just going to bless. I'm going to bless and declare the peace of Israel, yeah? That was, a, that was a drop everything and go moment. That was a leave your family, leave your everything, you know. Abraham was just plucked out of obscurity right there. He doesn't say anything about him. He just gives uh, his, his father, his household, and then it says, and God spoke to him. It, there wasn't any pre-relationship with God before that, from what it seems. He was plucked from obscurity, and he was thrust into the limelight as the blessed people. But he had to drop everything to be there. The nation of Israel, centuries later, they've been in Egypt as slaves for 400 years. And then the word says, leave Egypt, in Exodus 12, verse 31. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up, leave my people, you and the Israelites, go worship the Lord as you have requested, take your flocks and herds as you have, as you have said and go and also bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave their country, for otherwise they said, we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added. So they're in the middle of the great Israel bake-off, yeah? They're, they're, they're there producing their bread, it's bread week, and, and before they can add yeast, they're told, just go. And they but I'm in the middle of making the, I need to add the yeast. No, it's just go. But what about the yeast? Leave the yeast, just go. So they had to leave the yeast, and they went. That's why we, we quite often eat flatbread, yeah? Just leave the yeast. They carried it on their shoulders in kneading trowels, wrapped in clothing. So, so literally, it was a drop everything, and just gather what you can and go. Drop everything of your lifestyle, just take what you can carry and go. And obviously, prize bread week, didn't want to leave it behind, took it wrapped in clothes, took it, carried on with their food in hand. They were in, in the desert for 40 years and they were told to set up camp and every time they set up camp, they would, they would step out in the morning and they would see whether the, the cloud, the, the column of cloud was there or whether there was a column of fire and that was resting over the tabernacle. And every time the cloud moved or every time the, the fire moved, they were to grab everything and go. They were to drop what they were doing, they were to pick up and they were to go. And the, the Bible talks about the exodus and talks about the time in, in the desert. And there were so many of those, let's pick up, let's go. Let's pick up, let's go. We're here for a time, let's pick up, let's go. They didn't know when it was going to happen, but they were actually learning how to, d how to depend on God. They were learning how to be led by God. There was all, all process in what God was doing there, 
And God was having all these drop everything moments with them. Now they'd had the major drop everything when they left their life of 400 years, but it continued with drop everything moments. So there was initial drop everything and move into a relationship with God, and then there was a continual drop everything moments. Yeah? Again, a big event and then process. Event process. That, that is one of the things that God really does in most of the areas that he will work with us. There will be a big event and then there was a process. You get saved and then you live it out. You get healed and then you live it out. You, you receive faith and then you live it out. Yeah? You receive holiness and then you live it out. There is an event and then there's process. Lot, there's the initial drop everything moment and then there's many drop, drop everything moments. Yeah? David, King David, the best king that ever lived. 1 Samuel 19, verse 11. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, warned him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michal let David down through a window and he fled and escaped. It says later on that he, he arrived to, this, uh, uh, to meet up with Samuel and, uh, and he talks with the, the, the priests who are there and they say, oh David, who have you come with? He says, nobody, I'm on my own. I didn't even have time to pick up a sword and they give him Goliath's sword. He says, what have you got here? And they give him Goliath's sword. He didn't have time to do anything. Didn't have time to grab it. Literally, he just fled for his life. He didn't, he didn't even have time to pick up his weapons. And he's a warrior, so you think, with haste, he picked up and he fled. Elisha, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19. So Elijah went from there and I found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him, threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied, what have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people. They ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. So he had time for a final meal and a final goodbye, but he said goodbye to his parents and that was it. Likelihood it was, wasn't going to see them again. He said, love you, mum, love you, dad, thanks for everything. Thanks, oxen, for helping me plough the field. Now I'm going to kill you. And then he cooks them and and, and then shares the meat with everybody. Final blessing, and then he's off. Drop everything moment. Had a couple of hours, drop everything moment. Matthew 4, verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. I love that name, Zebedee. My mum used to say, time for bed, says Zebedee, or something like that. Is that the magic roundabout? Is that the magic, magic roundabout? It's nothing to do with Bible. My mum, oh man, mixes all these things. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. I just have this image of of the dad is there, and he's like, guys, guys, guys. He's just like, where have they gone? Guys, and they're they're just like, see you later, dad, we're off. And, and off they go. They just, they just follow Jesus. They immediately left. He called them and said, guys, come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. And they just drop everything. They literally dropped everything. They left their dad in the lurch, but they said, sorry, dad, we've got to answer the call. God is calling. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, 
For I have not come to call the righteous, come to call the sinners. Love that, absolutely love that. Now, the fishermen, they had a, a, a job that um, they could pretty much do wherever, wherever they went. Fishing was a, uh, a worldwide phenomenon. Anywhere this coast, you have need of fishermen. Um, Jesus is arrested, Jesus dies, Jesus rises again, but all the disciples have, have deserted Jesus. They've left him, and they're really feeling low. And several of the fishermen, they just go back to fish. It says they go back to fish. Jesus actually restores uh, Peter, because Peter is the one that denied him three times, you know, and Jesus looked at him and he's like, ah! And he's really heartbroken. He decides to go back and fish. He, he returns to what he was doing before Jesus called him. He just thought, you know, yeah, Jesus is risen again, but I'm useless, I'm no good, I'm going back to fish. You see, the fishermen, they had a trade that they could go back to no matter what. And they clearly did until Jesus restores them and says, no, remember guys, I've called you to be fishers of men. And he re reminds Peter, Peter, how much do you love me? And, and goes through all of that. Matthew, he was a tax collector. Yeah? He had a very good position on a very main road where all the people who came through that area had to pay the taxes. It was the taxes that Rome was, was demanding from the people, everybody who was there, and he had a very, very good position. He was sat there at the booth. The, we know it was a good position because Jesus was there on his circuit, and he was wandering around, and he comes to, to Matthew and he says, come and follow me. Now, Matthew would have been the likelihood is they were hated. The tax collectors were absolutely hated. They were like Manu supporters. They were absolutely hated the world over. And the reason why they were so disliked was because they would steal from the people. They would pay the taxes, but they would skim all the money and they would take a whole bunch for themselves. So they would overcharge the people. Nobody understood all the, the taxes. Like today, nobody understands all the taxes. They would take the money. They would steal the money. And they were loath. That's why the Pharisees, why does your Lord sit with tax collectors and sinners? Even, even distinguish the sinners and the tax collectors. Now Matthew was a tax collector. He was hated. When he steps up from his booth and says, I will follow you, this is not a job that he can return to afterwards. The fishermen, they, they can go and they can just throw a net. Matthew cannot. As soon as he steps up and goes, I will follow you, some other tax collectors like, this is a great spot, takes the, the place and starts charging the people. Matthew turns around, he's like, crikey, that didn't take long. My place is already, you know, his position is gone. He cannot go back. You see, when Matthew dropped everything, it was a literal drop everything moment and follow. You know, when, when Jesus dies and Matthew runs for it, the other guys are thinking, well, at least I can fish. Matthew's like, can anybody teach me? <laughs> can somebody give me a, throw me a bone here? I am completely at a loss here. I can't go back. If this Jesus is if he's truly dead, we are stuffed and you guys will make it. I am completely sunk. That's why I think that Matthew's response was actually a bit more severe than pretty much everybody else. He was a man of great wealth. We know that because he invited everyone around his house. And he actually had a group of enemies sat there, you know, eating and judging was a busy, had a big place, and he gave all that up to follow Jesus. We see the idea again and again, many more examples. Paul on the road to Damascus, you know, he, his, he, he's blinded, his eyes are truly opened. Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? He thought, no, I thought I was just persecuting the sect. No, 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 you're persecuting me. You're persecuting the church. You're persecuting me. Paul, from that point, he, he allies himself 
And this murderer becomes a saint. <laughs> this murderer becomes such an instrument in the hands of God. Noah, you know, I'm going to flood the land. It will never be the same. You better start building. Drop everything. Focus on this. Ruth, she has the chance. Go back. Your husband is dead. Go back. She turns to, to Naomi and she says, no, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Wherever you go, I go. Heaven forbid that I, I separate from you. She drops everything. She's a Moab, Moabitess. She, she should go back to Moab. But she says, no. And she becomes a great descendant of David, King David, and then of the line of Jesus. Look at that. Rahab the prostitute. Her walls are about to fall. And she says, actually, you know, all I'm going to do is just stick this little flag outside because the spies came, they stayed in my house. Drop everything, the walls are about to fall, but you will join with us. This prostitute, she also becomes one of the, the lineage of Jesus as well. She's of the lineage there. Isn't that amazing? Drop everything moments. There are so many more. The rich young ruler, Matthew 19, 21, Jesus answered, this guy comes and he's like, I've, he says, Lord, I've done everything since childhood. I, literally, I have done everything. Really, done, done absolutely everything. Yes, I have honoured my mother and my father and I've done this and I've done that and, and, and I've followed all the commandments, all of them, every single one of them. Oh, really have you? Jesus turns to him and says, okay, go and sell everything you have and follow me. Go and sell everything you have. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad <laughs> because he had great wealth. He went away sad. Jesus puts the gauntlet before him and says, drop everything, follow me. He had not followed all the commandments because the Bible says you won't have anything before God. Nothing before God. You won't have any God before me. You won't bow down before it. You won't honour that before me. No God before me. His God was wealth. His God was materialism. That was his first priority. And he had so much there that he just said no. And he went away sad. What a sad little man. Rich, young, sad ruler. You see, it is a choice. When God says drop everything, it is a choice. You have a, you have a choice. Not everyone is willing. You see, God is a God of drop everything and follow me. But he will give you that choice. I feel that God has a drop what you're doing and follow me moment for everyone. The event. He has a drop everything and follow me event for everybody. And then there's a continual Stop going in your own direction and follow me. Stop going after that and follow me. Leave that behind, follow me. And that is continual in our life. And it is a process. Praise God, it's a process. The guy that says, God, reveal everything to me in my life that is wrong is the guy who explodes in an instant, that sees everything. You know, what, what's it called? Uh, combustion? spontaneous combustion, there's just like smoking shoes left behind. He's, this is the person that said, God, reveal everything to me that needs to change. And God says, really? <laughs> God doesn't do that to you. He draws it out slowly as a process. He's a loving, loving God. He's patient. You know, he doesn't want to leave you in all of this stuff and with all this stuff. He wants to change you, but he will take his time doing it. And he will give you the choice. And little by little, the idea is that every day, like, like, like the morning sun that rises, that our life becomes more and more like Jesus. That more and more we follow him and we drop this stuff behind. So for the individual who walks with Jesus, there will be a, hey, I'm here and I have this for you moment. One of the reasons I actually got back in with God were because I fell in love with a woman and, uh, and I started going to the church, and, and there were actually two women. There were two women, and, uh, and I fell in love with both these women. And, and I wanted to be in this church close to these women and get to know them. And, um, and after a couple of months, God literally just gave me a slap around my head. 
and said, son, I am here. Why are you running after this? I am here. And, uh, and he really did. He just, he just, he just raptured my heart. He, he captured everything. And, and I, just, I just went, yeah, you're, you are here. Praise God that he did that. I, th- I think it was, it was the wife of Billy Graham that she said, if I'd, have, if I'd have married any of the men that I fell in love with before Billy, you know, my life would have been completely ruined. You know, don't trust your heart. Above all things, guard your heart. It is deceptive. But God came along, just smacked me around the head and just said, I am here, son. You're doing this. Why are you doing this? I'm here. And it was at a time when somebody just passed me a couple of teachings and uh, it was one of, the, one of the girls actually she passed me the teachings. And I just listened to these teachings again and again and again and, and fell in love with God. That was, that was really... And from that point on, nothing has ever compared. Annie has not compared to the love that I have for God. And she knows that. Now that's quite tough for some people to understand that I love God and that my love for Annie, which is massive and huge and grows every day because she's so lovable. But I know that she loves God much more than she loves me. And that gives me safety because she's attached to that well of love and so she is able to find the patience and the grace to love me with all of my messed up stuff. If she wasn't connected to God, I don't know how she would love me. So when God says, actually, you know, when he says, hate your mother or hate your father, he's not saying, hate your mother and hate your father. He's just saying, your love for me has to be the biggest thing. Nothing compares to that. It's almost as if that your love for them is that you just know. They just don't compare. God is all about families, and th- this, heck, this is what we're doing, no? This is what building is a family, so God is all for family. He loves families, and he talks about husband, love your wife, and wife loves about. He talks all about that. He talks about honour your father and your mother. He's not going against that when he says this. What he's saying is that I'm here. Drop everything, follow me. Nothing compares. Nothing, I th- that's, that, that would probably be the essence of it. Nothing compares to what I have for you. That is the drop everything. It isn't, it isn't leave your grandma in the middle of the road and run. <laughs> that's, that's not what it's saying. Leave them, you know. <laughs> what are the characteristics of the drop everything for God? Three characteristics to finish. <laughs> Number one, it is radical. It is a radical drop everything. It has to be radical. You see, Jesus' death on a cross was radical. Radical means extreme. Now, not extremism, but it is extreme. It's not extremism in that you're following something and everything else you just forget about and everything else is... No, actually, God loves all of this and that's why you have to be extreme. It's extreme so that you can bless all of that. It's not extreme that you hate and abhor everything around you and that you want to destroy everything around you. No, that is extremism. And Christian extremism leads to the Crusades. And that doesn't honour God. They don't honour God at all. It goes, flies against the face of God. It insults God. Extremism, no. Radicalism, yes. Loving God radically. Drop everything is that I am so in love with my God. You see, it is a burn the boats. We arrive at this new land, and so that nobody turns back. Dude, what happened to the boats? The captain burned them. Why? Because it's do or die, fellas. It's do or die. No turning back. It is radical because it is of extreme importance. We are talking about life or death. The Egyptians, they had brought slavery over Israel. The Israelites, they moved from from slavery into freedom. And yet some of them thought about wanting to go back into slavery. And God just said, what? 
It is a matter of life or death. You, 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 you live and you die a slave, or you live and you die in freedom. It is life or death. People knowing about Jesus is a question of life or death because they're slowly dying. There is a death sentence upon them that one day they will face because of sin in their lives. You and I would face that same death sentence if it wasn't for the fact that we recognize that Jesus already faced that death sentence and paid your debt. That's why it's so important. It is a matter of life and death. There is a death sentence hanging over all of us until Jesus comes and knocks that death sentence out. So when you are sharing with somebody, don't just think, oh, they may reject me. Oh, they may not like the words that I'm using. They are dying. They just don't know it. They're dying. It's a matter of life and death. That's why we've got to be radical. You see, if we are exactly the same as them, then our message has no power. If we live exactly the same as the world, our, our message has no power. They'll look at us and they'll say, well, you're no different to me. Well, well I'm sorry, but what are you bringing if, you're, if you live exactly the same as me? It is the world or it is Jesus. You can't have both. You see, drop everything is leave something behind, which does not compare to what God has for you. The parables of the, the found treasure in the plot of land, the guy goes and sells up everything and buys the land. Or the other one that comes along and finds the pearl and says, I've got to have that pearl. I, I need that pearl. And he goes and sells everything and buys the pearl. One of them just stumbled up across the treasure, not even looking for it. The other one was a bargain hunter, found it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how. They sold everything and they followed. They dropped everything and they followed. So it, it has to be radical. The second characteristic of drop everything is it is a life changer. It's not, it's not just a radical wow. It is a life changer. It completely changes your life. It changes life for you. It changes life for those around you. You will experience life for the very first time. And people around you will start to recognize there's something odd going on with you. Those people that have known you before and after Christ, I'd like to think that they say there's something different about this guy. So many families get saved because one person, the dad or the mum, gets saved. And the kids just say, he's not the same man. She's not the same woman. There's something about them that's changed. Our son got saved, and he was just this, this tear away and this and that and just didn't care at all. And something happened, and I can't deny. I may not believe in, in his God, but I cannot deny that a change has happened. And that change will speak volumes. Your life goals, your plans, your dreams will change in God. Because he'll say, I'm here, this is what I have for you. And this is much better than what you have for you. Everyday life will be different. Behaviours will be different. Habits will be different. The company who you spend time with will be different. It is lovely when we come together as people that, that love Jesus and we spend time and we're influenced and we influence that's why, that's why fellowship is so freaking amazing. I can say that, right? Joel's not here. Yeah. Our priorities will change. Our comfort level will change. You know, you may have everything and be happy and, and just think this is all great, I've got it all together, and God says, actually, drop everything, I've got something new for you. What? What? But we've just spent a decade building all this up. God says, you know what? I've got something amazing planned for you guys. And it means that you need to drop all of that, that you've dedicated so much building up, but it was for you, and it's lovely, but leave it. I've got something better for you. I've got this for you. You see, our citizenship, we have dual citizenship. We are of this place, but we are of heaven. And the minute 
that you become a citizen of heaven that trumps this place. Trump in a really good sense of the word, not Trump as in that fellow. Hmm. He will take us from comfort, from the known, into a place of discomfort and unknown. If you are not living on the edge, you are taking up too much room. God wants you to be uncomfortable. And the reason he wants that is because you will grow. And the reason he wants that is because you have to be the point of the spear and there is a lot of friction there. And it means that when you push on through, others can just go through with ease. This is the pioneer spirit. The pioneer spirit is that you break through and it's, and it's tough going. It's really hard. But without that pioneer spirit, you know, our, our goal is to pull people into the kingdom. And that means you and I face resistance that hopefully they will not until it comes their time. And you will go from a place of comfort to a place of discomfort. And, and, and the thing is that our comfort is not designated by the world. Our comfort comes from being in Christ. So that you can face whatever opposition, you can face whatever friction, but greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. So the comfort level of this world is secondary. My comfort comes from the comforter. And that's all I need. The third thing, you are not left empty-handed. You drop everything, but God will give you so much more than you could ever pick up. He will hold you in his hands and all that other stuff that he wants to bring in your life. You will not be empty-handed. Hebrews 12 verse 1, therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. Let's throw it off, let's drop everything and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, pioneer spirit right there, and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So you throw off everything that hinders you, and you run with Jesus. You, you, you drop everything that has no value for your life, that God would say, you don't need that, son. My daughter, you don't need that. Drop everything. I'll, I will give you this. I will give you so much more. The race marked out for you. The joy set before you. The place of authority that God has for you. Philippians 3 verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all of this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, letting go of what is behind, dropping everything behind, and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. I take a hold of the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You see, you drop everything that hinders you, sin, hurts and wounds, unforgiveness, insecurities, man-made religion, the attempt to find God's favour through acts and works, things that you do of yourself. That's not God's way. That actually offends God. Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, the, the basic principles, the, um, the foundations of faith, it says not returning to the rudiments of the faith. And it talks about... Uh, repentance of dead works and then faith in Jesus. Repentance of dead works. That's religion right there. Dead works. People trying to do stuff so that God, if I do this, God will love me. No, God loves you. You don't have to do that. You do that because God loves you. So you leave that behind. Religion is left behind. You don't have to do anything. The distractions of the world, the materialistic idea of the, the American or, or British dream. That doesn't have to be your goal. Your goal is Jesus. 
My God shall supply all my needs. That's it. I don't need more. Please, one of my needs, I want to visit Disney World. But outside of that, <laughs> what, am I, what are my needs? That's okay. I find that God will provide every one of my needs and will give me a little bit extra for my stupidities. He does that because he loves me. But the only thing I need, he fulfills. My finances, my everything I place in his... I follow the principles of what the Bible says and God meets all my needs. And he gives me a little bit more. But I, I, you know, it's not the focus. I throw it off. I throw it off. If that's the focus, so many rich people, so sad. The rich young ruler. You see, you press in, you gain Jesus. You gain salvation. Life-threatening salvation. You get the solution. Life-affirming salvation you have. You gain forgiveness, you pick up holiness, you pick up authority, you pick up a new identity. You're no longer fishermen, you are fishers of men. You serve the king. You do not leave empty-handed. You drop everything and God restores what he has for you. 